Let's pray. Dear Lord God, we just want to thank you for this time, God. Um, it's in times of need, Lord God, that we are reminded of the urgency of prayer, Lord God, of how we need to pray, what we need to pray for, God. I pray, Lord, that um, that as we come before you today, God, that you would make yourself known to us as we um, just read into your word, Lord God, and understand a little bit about what it means to truly trust in you, Lord God. We pray, Lord, that our spirits would be lifted to you, that you comfort those who need comforting, you lift up those who need lifting up, Lord God, that you encourage those who need encouraging, God. And we thank you, Lord, because you are a true living God that is able to do that. And I pray, Lord God, that our spirits would be open to you, Lord God, that our minds and our hearts would be open to you to be changed by you, Lord God, that, would be, that we would be more like you. We pray, Lord, today for this congregation, God, may you continue to work through them, work in them, and also build them up, Lord God, that you would continue to lift them up so that they would continue to do your will, Lord, until the day that you return. We thank you for this time, for this congregation, and for your word. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So today, uh, the topic is called Even If He Doesn't. And it's actually really... Um, a really interesting mindset, I believe, for a Christian, because very many of us do not have this mindset, right? And uh, like, let, let me put it this way. So normally, when we pray, go to prayer meeting, we do our Christian stuff, even though we don't say it, there's an expectation of some sort of response from God that is typically in our favor, right? We, we like to ask God of things that we assume he also wants. Right. So, for example, when we pray, like, dear Lord, would you bless us with like even when we're talking about a better job so that I may, you know, have more resources to give back to you or you ask for healing. You ask, say, hey, Lord, this is somebody who um, needs your healing. We know that you're a healer. And in this case, in in uh, House of Christ love, there's definitely that need. Right. And a lot of times we put ourselves in the mindset where we desire for God to fulfill what we need. And that's not wrong. Okay, I'm not saying that's wrong. But the question that we're going to have to deal with today, and it's a tough question, and believe me, I didn't know any of this information before I planned it. So it's a little bit tough for me to talk about this, especially when there's, you know, COVID and you guys are, uh, you know, struggling with other health things. But there's a, there's a, there's an idea or thought that goes through scripture that's kind of like, hey, what if God doesn't answer the prayers in the way that we assume that he should, right? Like, uh, I'll give you a perfect example. Some people have been praying for the salvation of some, like a friend or family member's soul for, you know, years and years and years. And from our perspective as Christians, wouldn't that be the prayer that God would answer, right? Hey, God, please give an opportunity to bring this person to Christ. It's pure. It's holy. It's exactly what God wants us to pray. But what happens if that person is not brought to Christ? Then how do we as Christians respond, right? And that, that's the tough question, right? Because the difficulty a lot of times with Christianity is that we build ourselves on so much hope that God will answer. But if he does not answer in the way that we want, it's very difficult to swallow. Very, very difficult to swallow. I'll tell you that from my personal experience as well. And so when we read the book of Daniel, right, there is a sentiment among Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And just a, I'll, I'll paraphrase because I know that you guys uh, probably know the story. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are Daniel's three friends. They get brought from Jerusalem, from Israel, into Babylon as a conquered people. They're there to train to, you know, learn Chaldean, like, you know, traditions, their history, how to rule their people. And basically... They are, um, the idea for the Babylonians is to assimilate these is Israelites into their culture so that they become not just a conquered people, but a people who fall in love with Babylonian culture and then will never rebel ever again. You kind of, kind of see that, uh, the, a common, this was a common way to do things, especially like, for example, Rome, right? Rome, uh, you know, like Rome was the empire that stood for a thousand years or whatever, and Romans did the same thing. They would go into an area, they would conquer them. After they would conquer them militarily, they would then do all this very beneficial stuff for the region. They would build you roads, they would set up schools, they set up, you know, like specific, like, you know, um, social services, you know, you can go for help here, there's guards, people are protected. 
and they would even allow you to worship your own god. And in doing so, what the Romans were hoping is that, hey, we've conquered you and taken your land, right? What we want is your tax money. So after that's set, you live your lives as is, and you don't have to worry ever again about being attacked or whatnot. And so the Babylonians were basically doing the same thing. They go into Israel, they conquer Israel, they bring back all the brightest and smartest and best looking um I would say kids, like they're, they're probably in their teens, early teens or late teens. And they want to bring them so that they would learn how advanced Babylonian culture is. And in doing so, they're hoping to kind of woo the hearts of the people they captured to say, hey, the Babylonians are the ones that we should follow. Being a province of Babylon is not a bad deal, right? And so they go in, they go through this, and eventually the king pushes the buttons or plays too close to the line. And what he does is that he says, hey, in, um, in chapter three, right, um, he proclaims that I'm going to build an idol to myself. And when you hear of all the music, everybody in the entire nation must bow down to this idol and worship it. And this is the bottom line for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Daniel's friends. And so they refuse. And when they refuse, the king's actually really upset. And this this anger is actually on multiple levels, right? It's not that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are some like, you know, farmers out in the fields who just say, we're not going to do this and we're just going to be quiet and nobody can see us. And therefore we are defying you, but you have no idea, King Nebuchadnezzar. If you actually read earlier on from chapter one and chapter two, what happens is that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are appointed over all the affairs of Babylon because of Daniel. Right, we'll get to that in a little bit because of Daniel. So these guys are prominent members of the political circle that is supposed to be serving King Nebuchadnezzar. And so when King Nebuchadnezzar sees that three of his top appointed officials are not doing what he says, he's of course extremely furious. Because not only is this a private affront to his kind of pride and his position, but it's also very public, right? Because these three, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, are known by basically the whole land because they're the ones administering all the care and all of the things that are happening within Babylon. So now King Nebuchadnezzar is mad. He's very, very angry, right? And he goes and he wants to build a furnace, which we know. If you've been in church for a long time, you know the story. He tells the furnace to be seven times as hot. Soldiers come in. He tells Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, hey, if you do not bow down and worship and I'm giving you another chance. If you do not worship the idol that I've made in my image, then I will cast you into this fiery furnace, right? And what we're focusing on today is actually the, um, the response from Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And the reason why I want to focus on this response is because I, I feel that for all Christians, when we are um, not necessarily confronted with uh, the difficulties that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are, uh, we find ourselves in a position where we kind of wish or hope or believe that we would have this type of response. And this is what we're going to read. Um, instead of reading the entire chapter three, I'll just point us to Daniel chapter three. And then I want, hmm, let's start reading from 13. We're going to read from 13 uh, to verse 18. 13 to 18. Up, oh, we have it right there. Perfect. It says, Then Nebuchadnezzar, in furious rage, commanded that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego be brought. So they brought these men before the king. Nebuchadnezzar answered and said to them, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up? Now, if you're ready, when you hear the sound of the horn, pipe, lyre, trigon, uh, harp, bagpipe, and every kind of music to fall down and worship the image that I have made well and good. But if you do not worship, you shall immediately be cast into a burning fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you, deliver you out of my hands? Now here's the response. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he would deliver us out of your hand, O king. Verse 18. But if not, 
be it known, O king, to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Man, the, uh, this response is um, pretty bold, right? It's one thing to have that faith where you say, God will definitely save me from this situation, right? That, that's what a lot of us pray, right? When we say, have faith, have faith, have faith, we, our faith is in the fact that God will save us from the circumstance because he is able. For Shadrach, Meshach, and again, Abednego, it's a little different. What they say is that if it be so, God whom we serve is able to, God can save us from the burning fires and he will deliver us from your hand. But then the second phrase is actually really important. It says, but if not, right? Even if he doesn't, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Man, that, that's just like a different level of faith, right? Because in essence, what they're saying is that we know that God is able to, but even if he does not, we will continue to follow the rules that he has set up. That mentality right there, I think is something that uh, most Christians, and I'll, I'll include myself in that, in that um, circle with that, that we lack. The resolve to say, hey, God is God, even if I do not get my way or am saved from the circumstances that I am in. And the difficulty of that phrase is, 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 is so apparent, not for people who are living in comfort, but rather for people who are suffering, right? If you are suffering something or you're in worry or something is happening, you're not sure, you are uncertain, the idea that you go before someone or something, a situation, and you say, hey, God has the ability to save me. But even if he doesn't, I continue to worship this God. Man, that's tough, right? Because what we're taught a lot of times in, in Christian faith and in church is this emphasis on God's power, right? God is able to do this. God is able to do that. And so therefore, we think about it as since God is able, he should, right? And if as long as it fits, obviously, to the, the, the entire path of God's plan, what we assume to be God's plan. Like, hey, this sounds like a good prayer. It's for God's kingdom. So therefore, he should be doing this for us. Right? Should. And that's how we live our Christian lives. We always live it when we pray. We assume that God has to answer in the way that we want. Very rarely do we push it to, even if he does not, I will continue to follow and serve God. You see, the, the tough choice here, a lot of times, is our presumption as to um, who God is and our innate desire to be in control, right? Because when we say, God, you need to do this thing for me, we are still assuming that God bows before our will, not the other way around, right? Because uh, when we pray and we pray, hey, God, your will be done, right? It's not so easy to really think to think about the consequence of when your will as Albert, like for example, for me, if my will is not done because God's will is not in, my will is not in line with God's will, then what my, what will my attitude be? Right. And this happens a lot, especially with injustice, right? Injustices in the world. Hey God, we are praying for these people that are downtrodden. We are praying for Christians who are, you know, persecuted. We're praying for circumstances which are really bad and like evil seems like it's winning. And we pray and evil continues to win. Many times you lose hope and you say, hey, um, where is God? Right. And by nature, this kind of issue rises up, not just it's not saying that we are weak or we well, we are weak, but not saying that we are somehow you know, cannot doubt, cannot be angry, cannot be frustrated. Because if you look at the Old Testament uh, um, prophets and the New Testament um, apostles and disciples and missionaries, it happens all the time, right? Prophet, oh Lord, I am the only one that's left. There's nobody else that is willing to follow your word. Kill me now, right? And that God has to respond and say, well, no, in reality, there's still 300 people who have not bowed their, bowed before 
uh, the idol set up. And this was in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, right, you get this idea of, like, for example, when Stephen is stoned to death, he chastises the Pharisees and Sadducees. But the last phrase, and you would think, like, if you're a bystander Christian, you're praying, God, please save Stephen, right? You've saved all these other people. Please save him. He is a man after your own heart. And as Stephen is stoned to death, and the final word Stephen says is what? Forgive them, right? Do not hold this against them. Same thing, just like Christ, right? Forgive them, for they know not what they do. So this concept of God's will superseding our will is very, very biblical, but in practice, not so easy. We want God, and rightly so, many uh, most, majority of the time, to fulfill the way that we desire things to, to pan out. And the difficulty of today's sermon is because, like, for me, personally, like, I'm that, I'm that way, too. When I pray and I look at injustice, I look at difficulty, I look at something that is unrighteous happening, my prayer is always, God, why won't you fix this? I can't fix it. I don't have the power. I acknowledge you are more powerful than me. You're the one with all of the power, all the authority. So, God, you need to fix it. And the tough part is, when God doesn't fix it or doesn't fix it like I want him to fix it, then there's always a little bit of a waiver, right? There's always a little bit of a, well, okay, you don't do that. Well, then where is God? What's the point, right? And uh, like my dad's always told me very often that in these times of situations, he always cautions. He says, I want to see God work. And I say, that's great, but what if God is trying to work through us to do something? Then we're just staying silent and not doing anything. We're not actively pursuing righteousness or justice. We're not going out there and fighting when we need to be. And the response is still the same. Hey, we, I want to wait for God to do something. I want to see what God is doing. And that, that sort of uh, mentality is so hard because in a day and age where we are able to do many things, we many times refuse to sit and allow God to do something because we fear that God will not do it according to the way that we want. And when God doesn't do that, you see there's an entire generation of people that will fall away or entire group of people that will fall away and say, Hey, God is not real. He did not heal my grandmother, my mother, my son, my daughter, right? He did not give me the position I wanted. I keep seeing hypocrisy in the church and blah, 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 blah. And we can go on and on with the list. And very rarely are we able to do what Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did, which was say, hey, God is able. He can. He'll save us. But even if he doesn't, we continue to follow his word and what he does and what he has called us to do. You see, the, 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 the craziness of that phrase and the proclamation before the king is one that, um, that I think that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego um, in the moment presented to him. Because what they did was not only did they challenge the king by not bowing down to the idols, but they told the king that your value within our hearts is below everything. Our lives... And the God that we serve are completely above you. No matter what you say as a earthly authority, we refuse to bow down to that. Now, um, if it was me, right, um, and Albert was there, and Albert is more of an aggressive, you know, factual, uh, do something kind of guy. And I was Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. I would, I would have whispered to them, hey, guys, this is the end. Let's not get burned alive. Let's go down fighting. So you take the guard on the left. You take the guard on the right. I'll take the middle and go after the king. And let's see. We'll, we're going to die. But if we're going to die, we're going to die on our own terms. Okay? So let's go. Let's do it. And so if it was Albert, Albert would have planned this and be like, okay, if we're going to die anyway because the furnace is there, uh, we might as well go down fighting. Forget this whole bound before the king. Let's make a... Let's make our mark on history as the people who stood up the King Nebuchadnezzar and, you know, fought our way three versus a thousand around the king. And everybody will know that we have to fight the king. That would have been like kind of my mentality, right? Hey, we need to do something. We need to show 
that we are not going to go down without a fight. Now, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, however, have this conversation with the king. And they come back, and the final conclusion is that, hey, we are willing to die. And even if we do, and even if God doesn't save us, that's okay. No problem. Man, that, that, that's hard. And the toughest part of all of this is that as Christians nowadays, we, very, we desire to have that mindset and the heart, but we very rarely understand how to get to that position. How do you become someone who says, hey, even if he doesn't, in this hardship that I'm in, I pray that God will solve it. But even if he doesn't, I will not abandon my faith and I will continue to cling to what I know and who I know is the Lord and Savior and Creator. Right? How do you get there? We can say all those things, but very few of us ever run into a situation um, in life uh, where we need to say something like that. I mean, people who are suffering, who have health issues that, you know, medicine cannot solve, man, th those are times when it becomes very, very difficult, right? Um, I, I can tell you, for example, when a church has to pray over something that they have no control over, uh, like, you know, somebody goes into a coma or something happens and you say, oh, well, what can we do? Can we put more resources, more money? Can we call another doctor? And it's all, no, 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 no. It's up to God. Then the church gets together and they pray. And it's always that last resort, right? Prayer and God always becomes a last resort. Because we, I think that internally, at least for me, I fear what happens if God does not do something. So I try my best first. But what if it was God's choice from the beginning to not go according to what I want? So we're going to look at Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego now. Because in order to get to this mindset and to understand why the hearts of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are so immovable and they are so rooted in who God is, we have to kind of understand their story, right? And it's this, this between them going into Babylon and then them having to deal with this golden image, I think it's probably around approximately 20 years time. So if you went into Babylon, you were captured as like, you know, a 15-year-old, you would be probably around 35 now, right? You'd be your late 30s. You're old enough to now rule over a bunch of stuff and your wisdom, and you've already built up um, all of the influence and power and, you know, the, the, your work speaks for itself at this point. And it all does not begin with, hey, I became a Christian. All of a sudden, I have all this faith. If you look at Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, um, their faith begins with the story of Daniel and his friends. When they first come into Babylon, yeah, so let, let's take a step back, right? How did they get there? Babylon literally murders a, month, a bunch of their kinsmen. And then in the agreement to cease fire and stop killing more Israelites, they go and they capture all the sons of and the, the, the best of the best, the next generation of leaders from Israel, and they bring, it to, bring them to Babylon. So they are captured, right? And in this capture, what typically in like, you know, warfare, it's almost like, hey, king, send your son over to my kingdom, because if you ever do anything, I will then execute your son. It's basically assurance that nobody will rise up in rebellion. So they take the entire generation of next leaders, and it says in scripture, actually, uh, they're also good looking, right? Um, that, that's an interesting, interesting part. Um, it says this. Youths without, uh, I'll read from verse three, Daniel chapter one, verse three. Then the king commanded Ashpenaz, the chief eunuch, to bring some of the people of Israel, both of the royal family and of nobility, youths without blemish, of good appearance, and skillful in all wisdom, endowed with knowledge, understanding, learning, and competent to stand in the king's palace to teach them the literature and language of the Chaldeans. You see, without blemish, royalty, nobility, good appearance, wise, endowed with knowledge, understanding, and learning, competent. You see, all those things are literally what Daniel and his friends are. They are the cream of the crop. They are best of the best coming out of Israel. And they capture them. And in the very beginning of their training, these four 
are so outstanding, right? But then how do we get to this mindset where they have not abandoned God? Because you have to remember, it's literally like moving from like a second world nation into like a first world nation for them. Like they went to Oxford, right? To study and they are surrounded by the most technology, the most art, the most culture, the, the, the nation that has conquered the world, that kind of attitude. Right. And so when you look at Daniel's friends, they have gone into a place that is far better than where they came from. But remember, they're also not the only ones. Right. Other youths have also brought over. And in the span of this time, they are fed well. They are taken care, taken care of. They are educated. And so they're in this place where, hey, you want to move ahead in this world? Israel is a small place. What the Babylonians are showing you is the rest of the ancient world. You become a leader here. You become a leader of basically the entire world. You go someplace, you have more authority than you ever would have had if you were just some little Israelite, you know, going to, you know, making your money from like, you know, shepherding or like, you know, trying to raise crops, whatever it is, you are literally top of the world. And that to a lot of us would be a great opportunity, right? Yeah, I came from this place. They conquered us. But wow, they're giving us the opportunity. And if I raise my position, one day I can bring my people with me. That could be the attitude, right? Or these young people come in. They realize they have everything. It's very easy to get distracted. You get all the best food. You get all the best entertainment. You go in there and you realize that, wow, there's a whole nother world of material wealth and gain and knowledge that I can get here. Why not? right? Why not? But the thing is, in the very beginning, why are Daniel and his friends able to first say, we do not want to eat the king's food or drink the king's wine, right? It begins with God's word. They have to know God's word. They have to understand. They have to already been completely infused in God's word to understand why and to actually realize that, hey, we shall not bow down to any other idols. We do not eat food sacrifice to idols. So before they left, whoever was their person in Israel, whether it's the parents or teachers back in Israel, told them, hey, never forget the Lord God. Now, why is this so difficult? This is difficult because, remember, their end mindset that we're trying to get to is even if he doesn't, right? And in the very beginning of their lives, they were probably praying to God that the Babylonians would be defeated so they could have their nation back. And did God deliver them? The answer is no. God had them captured and brought into the nation of Babylon. And from that perspective, when you look at that, they grow their faith from the very beginning where God did not answer probably their most urgent prayer. Difficult. How many other, other youth are mentioned here? I mean, it doesn't say anything about them. Could, could they have fallen away, said, hey, God never answered, so I don't believe in this God anymore. That's very, very possible, right? It's very possible. Because they have just been defeated, even though they believe that they're God to be the strongest, and they become conquered, and they are brought into the nation of Babylon. But their knowledge of the word of God and their faith in the word of God begins to grow at that point. Because what they do is that they present themselves something very, very simple. They say, as these teenagers, we can't fight this army. But what we can do is we can keep ourselves pure. So therefore, please do not force us to eat the meat, sacrifice to idols. Do not uh, give us the wine that the king drinks. Give us water and vegetables, right? Water and vegetables. And it says in chapter one that they became that they became like more um, better in appearance, fatter than in flesh than all the other youth who ate the king's food. And so then the steward took away their food and wine and just gave them vegetables from then on. If you look there in verse 15, 16, thank you so much, by the way. Whoever's doing the Bible stuff, the, you're on point. I love it. When you look at that, God blessed them, but not really in a way where it's so apparent where God, like, you know, did a miracle. 
All they said was that we want to follow God's word. And so then therefore God allows them to be better in appearance than all the other youth. And they were given the opportunity to cling and hold on to their faith. Verse 17, when you see, it says, as for these four youth, God gave them learning and skill in all literature and wisdom and had understanding in all visions and dreams. So you see here from the very beginning of their walk, they're not, you know, faced with a life or death situation. They merely said, hey, we do not want to defile ourselves. And God gave them the blessing before the steward to say, hey, do not allow them to defile themselves. And they didn't. And that begins their, their faith, right? Their resolve um, right there is in, um, in chapter 1, verse 8. It says, uh, if we could go up to verse 8, it says, Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine that he drank, right? That resolve is a resolve of probably a young, early teenager along with his friends in a foreign land after their God had not answered their prayer for deliverance. Think about that. A 13 to 15 year old, maybe at maximum 18 year old, goes into this nation, is conquered, conquered nation. His God doesn't appear to be more powerful than the other gods. He is now in captivity, yet he resolves himself. It becomes a choice for him to say, hey, God, I will follow you no matter what. That resolve then carries on, right? Because you're trusting the word of the Lord. They, see, trust is very easy when everything goes your way. Trust is very, very simple when they, when you get what you want. Trust is not so simple when every time you ask for something, it's always no. That's when faith needs to be there, right? And the experience that they get from this trust in the Lord is like we just read, where God gives them learning, skilled literature and wisdom, and Daniel understanding all dreams. And then comes the continued growth, because there has to be an application of this gift that God has given you. Most of us would be very complacent. God gives us this gift. We just do our best, and we make our money. We become good. And we say, hey, as long as we don't rock the boat, as long as we stay very, very steady and we survive, that's, that's it. We've done our job. We are doing the best that we can where we are. But then they're encountered with the first issue, right? The first issue is that um, Nebuchadnezzar has a dream. And this is in, ver in chapter two. He has a dream that his wise men cannot answer, right? And Daniel and his friends go out on a limb and they begin to understand, you know what? that God continues to be in control. Because the uh, the King Nebuchadnezzar says, okay, if you can't answer this and you're telling me nobody, none of the wise people can answer this, I want my soldiers to kill all you wise people, like all the wise men of the nation, because you guys are pointless. You guys are worthless. You can't help me solve any of my problems. And he's very, very mad. So they start going out, they start killing. And if you read in chapter two, they encounter Daniel and Daniel says, hey, hold on a second. Why is this so urgent? And then he goes out on a limb and he literally says, hey, tell the king to give us a couple days. And after you gave us, give us a couple days. And this is in verse uh, 16, right? Daniel went in and requested that the king to appoint him a time that he may show the interpretation to the king. Now you want to talk faith? In the midst of being killed, Daniel literally trusts that God will give him the ability. How? How does he know that? The reason is because God has already shown him in previous verses that he's given him the gift of what? Of interpretation, right? This was in, um, in verse, um, verse 20 of chapter 1. In every matter of wisdom, understanding about which the king inquired them, they found them 10 times better than all the magicians and enchanters that were in all the kingdom. And in verse 17, is where these four youth, God gave them learning, skill, literature, and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. So Daniel comes in, and now he has to apply that faith. Under pressure, king says, hey, we're going to kill you all. Daniel says, whoa, hold on a second. Goes to the king, asks for time boldly. And then what he does is that he goes to his house in verse 17 and made the matter known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, his companions. 
and told them to seek mercy from the God of heaven concerning this ministry so that Daniel and his companions might, might not be destroyed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. Right, brothers and sisters, this is exactly the mentality that we need. First comes a resolve, right? That resolve comes from us having to understand the word of God. Then when we are resolved, God gives us the experience and his giftings to allow us to see our gifts in Christ grow, right? But then when it comes time to apply, what he does is that he brings together the body, his friends, and in faith, they pray, knowing that God has already answered their previous prayers. They're building up this kind of like this, this list of God being faithful. And in their faithfulness, they understand, hey, God is real. God is doing something. And then all of a sudden he goes and he goes out on a limb in this difficult situation. He doesn't first say to his friends, hey, let's come up with a plan. Maybe we need to escape now, right? He hasn't told me what the dream was. And um, since we're all here, let's get together. Let's plan on moving out in the middle of the night. I bought us a couple of days, right? Again, going back to Albert's, you know, thinking, Albert would have been ready to pop, like, to flee jail, right? To somehow escape. To bribe a couple guards, get out of there, make my way back into Israel, right? That's, that's my mentality. But Daniel goes and he says to them, seek mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery. So they immediately go to God, right? And then what happens is that uh, Nebuchadnezzar, obviously I'm fast forwarding now, Nebuchadnezzar gets the mystery answered. Daniel becomes second in command. And then Daniel using his authority uh, gets the king to appoint Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to become administrators within the nation. So that's at the end of chapter two, right? And in the end of chapter two, what you get here is that uh, the king actually then bows down and pays homage to Daniel. And it says, truly your God is God of gods and Lord of kings and revealer of mysteries, for you have been able to reveal this mystery. Then the king gave Daniel high honors, great gifts, made him ruler over the whole province of Babylon and chief prefect over all the wise men. And then by Daniel's request, he appoints Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego over the affairs of Babylon, but Daniel remains at the king's court. So Daniel becomes the right-hand man of the king. And this is all because they understood. Remember, these four understood what they had just prayed. Hey, God, please give us your mercy. Reveal to us the king's dream so that what? So that we can remain, right? And God grants that wish. And then brings us now to... And that, that's the faith, right? The application of God's, God's word, right? And I'm going to go back again. First is the understanding of God's word. They were taught this. Then they had the resolve to never break God's word in their situation with the, the, the vegetables and, and, um, and water. They experienced God's word and his promises through as God builds them up to be able to, to you know, do signs, of, uh, do uh, understand visions, and also to learn all sorts of wisdom. And then they apply God's word and saw that God was faithful in the dream sequence for Nebuchadnezzar. And in all of that, all of a sudden, now you reach into this point, which is, hey, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are now before the king. And the king says, hey, I'm going to throw you in the fiery furnace if you do not worship the idol that I've made. It's at this point, the mentality for these three is one of sacrifice. They already know. They already have the resolve. They have the experience. And through those three things, they're able to say, hey, we are willing to sacrifice for God. We've gotten to this point. God, you will never abandon us. Whether we live or die here and now, you will never abandon us. And so therefore, then the phrase comes out, even if he doesn't, we will never bow down to your idol, O king, right? O king, we will not serve your gods and worship the golden image that you have set up. But that verse 18, but if not, be it known, right? Not only that, though, if you go up a little bit uh, more into verse 16, their attitude towards the king is one that they do not ever compromise the position of God in their heart. There's no compromise saying that, well, if God lets us, then maybe we can do 
you know, it says, we have no need to answer you in this matter. We have no need. Meaning what? Meaning our allegiance to God makes it so that we can remain silent before you and it does not matter to us. But they still answer so that Nebuchadnezzar understands where this is coming from, right? It says, if this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king, right? But if not, and even more so, if you go, um, if you go up a couple more verses um, in verse... Sorry. Um, sorry, verse 14. Uh, can we go just up a little bit? Nebuchadnezzar answered them and said, Is it true, O Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image I have set up? Right there that you do not serve my gods is not such a simple phrase as in the here and now you are refusing to worship the golden image. What that shows right there is actually it has been a consistent thing with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego that they do not serve their gods, right? It's something that everybody knows. King Nebuchadnezzar also probably knows. And so when you look at this, it is not a matter of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego continually compromise just to stay alive. And then all of a sudden at the end, they're like, hey, this is the moment in time that we need to shine. No, they've been doing this continuously from the moment they got into Babylon until now. And so therefore, that is why there is no hesitation when they say, hey, King Nebuchadnezzar, we still trust in our God, not in you. You see, brothers and sisters, we always want that end result of the courage to say, even if God doesn't. But we very rarely think about what it takes to get there because their life was uncompromising in their personal lives. Right? They did not try to start some rebellion to you know, apply you know, biblical principle across the board and try to you know, do these things to affect all of Babylon. No, the first and foremost thing that they did was they kept themselves pure. And when challenged on that purity of their worship and service of God, then they responded. Right? They, there's, there's a little bit of a, of a misunderstanding. Um, I think within Christian circles that if you are loud um, about your faith, like very loud about your faith, that somehow that makes you more faithful. Um, that that's not the case, right? Because circumstances, situations are very, very different. I will not say that somebody who is loud about their faith, holding their Bible in school or praying before their meals or doing all these quote unquote Bible things, quoting scripture every time they talk is any more is not holier than someone who has to remain very quiet, let's say in the Middle East or where Christianity is, is, um, is persecuted. Christians are persecuted because circumstances are different. We're allowed to be loud in America. We can be as loud and obnoxious about our faith as we want to because our society and our culture allows us to. But doesn't mean that we are somehow more faithful or more effective just because we're willing to hold the Bible up in the air and yell and holler about how our God has given us a vision to do. No, that's not the case. It is the personal, uncompromising faith of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and Daniel that give them the ability to have the faith at the very end to stand up to King Nebuchadnezzar. Now, for us as Christians... When we run into difficulty, it's not so easy just to say, well, God, even if you don't and not lose faith, if we do not have the building blocks that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had. That building block, again, begins with understanding the word of God, right? God tells us this, we hold it to our hearts, and we understand. It also does not just end there because then we have to make resolve to say, hey, God, I will cling to you and your word no matter what, right? No matter what. That resolve is necessary. Hearing is one thing. The ability to say to yourself and to say to God, hey, God, no matter what, I want to cling to you is a different story. 
But God doesn't ever leave us there. If you actually think about uh, some Christians' lives, like go talk to somebody who's more mature as a Christian, you'll realize that small resolves about God's word and about God's promises lead to experiences that God presents to them. And when these experiences build up over time, as long as they remember the salvation of God, the grace and mercy of God, that then builds the faith necessary when you run into circumstances like, you know, uh, when King Nebuchadnezzar has a dream, right? And for us in the circumstances where we must choose between God and the world. And then finally, in that circumstance, when we have learned that God is real and our faith has been deeply rooted in God's word, then and only then can we truly come to the point where we are able to sacrifice before something and say, hey, even if he doesn't answer in the way that I want, I will remain faithful to the Lord. And I, I don't want to trivialize this. It's not easy, right? It takes literally a lifetime of understanding and of God answering prayers and of struggle and of growing and of understanding God's word more and then going through difficulties time and time again that brings us to a point where we no longer have to fear anything you see there's there's a um it's it's interesting um when you look at circumstances which people run into like you know hey I can't do this anymore right um, when you're at your wit's end, end of the rope, there's nothing that can be done physically in this world. Uh, the responses of many um, many Christians is that God is our last ditch effort, right? We've got nothing else, so therefore we got to go to God. If you look at the way Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and Daniel deal with their problems, the first thing that they do is go to God, and then they let God work. Right, but that doesn't mean that they don't do their part as well. Because remember, it, it's not it's not like um like sometimes like if you're in college or you're studying. I remember doing this. Uh, you don't study at all for an exam, and then the night before the exam, you're like, oh no, I don't want to fail. So you pray to God, God, if you just give me a C or a B, then I will be okay. Like I will never defy you ever again. I'll study hard. I'll go to Bible study. I'll go to prayer meeting. I'll do whatever you want. Just don't let me fail. Like that's not the way to cultivate the attitude of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, right? They, they were top of their class. And it's not just because they weren't studying. Like God gave them the ability, but they still had to apply it. So they were continually working but yet the first thing that they did even with all of that ability was go to god and say hey god give us your mercy and your grace to pass this circumstance we are going to continue doing what we're doing but we remember that you are first and foremost above all and if we as believers can get to that point i mean that's that would be amazing right but that is the journey and the walk of a Christian as they grow in faith. And I hope that uh, for us, when we encounter difficulty, right, we need to learn to do the same same things that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did. We need to learn how to set that framework, that groundwork, right, to be on solid ground and slowly begin to build up so that when God really calls us to make a difficult, difficult choice, With no hesitation, we will say, hey, we believe that God will deliver us. And even if he doesn't, we continue to follow God. Because if we don't do that, then that's when we falter. That's when it becomes very, very difficult. That's when it becomes, hey, is God real or not? But God is gracious and merciful. You you notice how when when Daniel goes and encounters the, um, the, the, the situation with Nebuchadnezzar's dream, he says, let's go and plead for the mercy of God. He doesn't want just the power of God or the wisdom of God to solve the issue. They go and they understand who it is, who is in control at that point in time. And that's why they, re- they request mercy, not knowledge, not wisdom, right? Not power, but rather they request of the mercy of God because they know that God is the only one who's able to move things willingly in this world. And he's the only one who is in control and in power. And brothers and sisters, I know that you guys are going through some difficulty and COVID is always a little scary, right? Especially now as a dad of two kids who can't get vaccinations. 
um, it, it's it's not easy whenever they cough or they have like you know sneezing or you know feel a little warm. Um, and it becomes very difficult for those who are parents to be able to say before God, hey, even if you don't help my kid out, right, I will continue to follow you. That's that's not easy. That's that's tough. It's very, very hard. But I pray that all of us can grow our spiritual lives in times of danger or need, but also grow in times where we are you know, comfortable. Everything is going well because we need to build that so that when God calls us to do the difficult, we can with faith, with courage, with conviction, with resolve, say, hey, we will follow the Lord even if he doesn't rescue us from this specific situation. And that is my prayer for this congregation and for myself as well. So with that, let me pray. Dear Lord, we just want to thank you for this time. We pray, Lord, that as we uh, present our lives before you in this congregation, before you, God, may you give us the ability to truly read your word and understand it, to have the resolve to follow it no matter what, Lord God, that we would experience you in, with your grace and your mercy uh, pushing us forward, Lord God, that we would use our gifts for you and your kingdom. And finally, if that day comes, Lord God, when we must sacrifice for your word and for who you are, Lord God, may, may we never hesitate. May we not hesitate, God. We thank you for this time. We pray, Lord, that you would continue to pour out your love upon this congregation, Lord, and that you continue to use them and work through them. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.